trends fluctuate. Understand both the crisis of overcrowding in the adult prison system and the rate of vacancies in our juvenile uh, prison system. Take responsibility to solve the com uh, community crisis, reform the Wisconsin criminal justice system, and we can learn from other states to guide our reform. There are so many other states who are doing so, so much better than uh, we are and are closing prisons. Why is it that we're talking about building prisons and sending in the entire state? This, this presentation does not seek to address every issue that must be acted on within the criminal justice system. And what it doesn't address is the daily treatment of inmates and clients on community supervision. We're going to touch on a little bit of that tonight. It does not address personal uh, uh, shortages and caseload issues within the Department of Corrections, meaning that uh, uh, the caseloads are, are very, very high and it has become unsafe because of the open positions within the Department of Corrections. I want to touch on some of the myths. Uh, and one is something that we hear often, nonviolent offenders only, or drug offenders only. Those are terms that are, thought, are tossed around uh, when it comes to talking about reform. Reform must apply to a larger population. The majority of the Wisconsin prison populations population have uh, committed a crime of violence. Wrong, it's not DOC's fault, largely DLC gets what our court sent them. Uh, they are largely non-discretionary with exceptions to revocation and parole. The DOC does not have discretion on release. Prison population is rising because crime is also rising. Again, wrong. Uh, in Wisconsin the, and nationally, crime has fallen steadily for the for the late 1990s, except for a major spike in 2015 in violent crime, crime rates are generally lower today than they were 20 years ago. Wisconsin Department of Correction does many things well, and, and I, I want to. Uh, Give a thumbs up to that. Uh, improvement and, and to the expansion of reentry programs has grown tremendously. Uh, I'm not going to say tremendously, but it has grown. And I know that uh, the reentry department within the Department of Correction uh, really, really are fighting to uh, do the right thing and get individuals trained uh, prior to leaving the prison. And they have some initiatives that are. Uh, really productive in my, in my opinion because they're taking individuals in the Milwaukee area to MATC at night who are learning C and N machine and they have a mobile de uh, uh, device, a CNN device that, uh, that goes around where they can also learn in that. And those are some of the things that uh, community corrections is attempting to do. Increase use of uh, uh, evidence-based decision making. Uh, that is something that's new to our department. Other states have been doing it for, for years, uh, but we are doing it now. And public access to data, huge. The next slide, uh, the DOC resources. What uh, Representative Gordon was doing was just uh, giving us uh, the resources and places where we can go get data and get information about what they're doing in community corrections and uh, the populations, and uh, lately it's been a big spike in uh, prison overcrowding. And they're not just saying prison overcrowding, they're saying this prison is overcrowded. This prison, in reality, all of them are overcrowded. But now they're talking about the individual. Some more stuff that I cannot see even with my glasses on. <laughs> But this is 
uh, some of the data research that uh, Representative Gorky did, and maybe uh, he could talk you through this when I should. <laughs> This is the population that uh, we have been monitoring for some time now. Uh, here you see the design of capacity, uh, what the trends have been, and this is, is, is where we are now. Uh, when we say yeah, it made 501, you can see how close we are to reaching that number before starting to send individuals out of state. Uh, the count today, uh, was 476, and I, I just got this information today, of individuals who are in uh, county bids uh, who are DOC uh, prisoners. Uh, 476 people are in county bids. Once we hit 500, we've reached what was budgeted for in the budget, and in May 501, we're more than likely to have to be sent out of state. Uh, DCC numbers, I, I, I can't touch on those. That's the Department of Community Corrections. Uh, oh, these are the individuals in county bids uh, who are in, uh, the, who are within community corrections being ill on a POO or other reasons. We do have a facility in Milwaukee called the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility that is built and designed just for individuals who are in a revocation process uh, or who are on a PO Contract bids are kind of touched on that. And as you can see, the trend is going up. Between 2016 and 18, and again, Total available is 500 and we are at 476. Contract bid projected growth. This is a, a, a stat that he uh, does that talks about the project, projected growth um, for contract bids, even if we increase the budget for many county bids. Okay. The cost of adult prison overcrowding daily rate is $51.50 a day per inmate. $51.50 uh, times $476, 476 inmates uh, comes to a total cost of $24,514 a day. Monthly expenses, as you can see, uh, for 30 days is $700,000 a month. Annually, $8.4 million, $8 million. And already, uh, the overall DC, DOC budget is $1.2 million. Lincoln Hills. I did get some news uh, today from Lincoln Hills. And I believe I do have it here. But as you know, the governor uh, stood behind this because Lincoln Hills was only 70 percent uh, vacant. Give you opportunity to just look at uh, the facility, and the X's are uh, buildings that are uh, occupied at this time. 70% vacant. So those are the ones that are vacant, I apologize. And these over here, that's uh, 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 education, uh, HSU, the administrative office there. Uh, and so he laid that out for us. Next slide. Beginning in 1990, Wisconsin numbers on uh, incarcerated children uh, juveniles fell steadily. Once housed over a thousand juveniles, by 2000, the three juvenile prisons was consolidated into one, and that is Lincoln Hills Copper Lake. 
At the time, consolidation of Lincoln Hill housed 252 now. The facility has a design capacity of five, uh, 500, so it would have to have at one time there. January 2012, judge writes a uh, walk about problems, inmate sexual assault, medical attention, so, 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 so. Uh, We all heard about that. The, uh, it made big news here in our state. June 2014, American Psychological Association finds problems. And they went through the process in January. Uh, DOJ investigation began in December 2015. Uh, offense came in, and Secretary Ed Wall resigned in February after this thing broke open. Then there was a civil rights investigation that began in March 2016, and now lawsuits alleged improper conditions, and so it goes on. Okay, here's a chart on the declining juvenile population. Pretty much speaks for itself. Due to the declining population, uh, calls per inmates are costing us more in our state. It's costing us more because there are less people there. In 2017, Lincoln Hills cost $292 per juvenile per day. Um, $106,580 per year per juvenile. $106,580 per year. 2018, the rate has increased to $390 per day per juvenile, $142,350 a year per juvenile. <coughs> the high cost continues to drive, uh, to drive counties to find cheap alternatives, which will reduce the population up to $35,770 per year. Cycle of replacement, uh, the sustainability of leaving the hill is only dead. Solutions. In an era of high, <coughs> hyper polarization, criminal justice reform has emerged as a surprisingly bipartisan issue. Around the country, dozens of states have engaged in meaningful criminal justice reform. Representative Gorky has introduced three reform proposals for the state of Wisconsin. <coughs> AB 791 closed Lincoln Hills and repurposed it as a treatment facility for adults within the Department of Correction. Capacity for 500 inmates providing immediate relief of overcrowding and saving from fuel contract bids. That's one of the Replace juvenile prisons, prisons with smaller regional and risk-based facilities. The new juvenile model will be safer for juveniles and for staff. More individualized treatment and education, reduce recidivism, reduce, reducing crime in our communities. AB 791. Uh, this is the chart of the Wisconsin adult prison system. I'll give you a couple of minutes to just look at that. Everyone goes through DOCS, they do a, a risk assessment, assessment, and from there you go to a medium, a, a, a minimum, medium, or maximum security prison. With Lincoln Hills, the risk levels are not separated appropriately, which leads to problems in high risk recidivism and recidivism rates. Excuse me. release program. This is something that's, that has been a while for a while. Uh, a while. The earned release program was, a, it was expanded in 2018-2019 budget and the 250 new treatment beds uh, within the Department of Corrections. As you can see, the cost there, 1.8 million. 
um, but that saves 2.8 million. So uh, even corrections know that treatment works and is cheaper. Average census reduced by 384 days to help ease overcrowding. These are things that can work. 5,900 inmates on the waiting list for treatment beds in the earned release program. If we can expand those beds, we can reduce the prison population. But that's a heck of a waiting list, 5,900 inmates waiting for treatment. And I know over the years I've seen so many men who come out who never got treatment. And I uh, took a look at uh, New Jersey and what they did. Governor Christie at the time uh, plans to turn state prisons into drug treatment centers. It's something that they did do. And I don't know if we have a cost analysis on, on how much money they save, but many states uh, put dollars into what we call treatment alternative and diversion. Uh, it is something that's funded in Wisconsin. At the current time, it's funded at $6 million, which is nothing for treatment in a state. Uh, Governor Christie uh, put in hundreds of millions, a hundred something million dollars, and has got tremendous results and has reduced their prison budget by billions, hundreds of millions. Texas is another place that uh, uh, who utilize treatment in the community and increase their tag dollar spending. Uh, Texas invested close to $200 billion in treatment. And uh, since doing that, they have closed four prisons. And it's my understanding that two more will be closed this year in that state. Uh, Texas can do it. What is that saying about us? Crimeless revocation reform. Hmm. It just makes my skin crawl. Uh, AB 796, crimeless revocation reform. To maintain the DOC ability to incarcerate for a rule-only violation, but limit times, uh, the, limit time, the length of time that individuals uh, would be incarcerated to not more than 30 days. <coughs> it's a move forward. All the time Wisconsin prison inmates must serve time on supervision after their release. That's a fact as part of the sentencing structure. Uh, you, get, you get sentenced to a sentence, <coughs> And you also get sentenced to extended supervision. They go ahead and that. Revocation happens if supervision rules are broken. Inmates may be re incarcerated for <coughs> pretty much any violation. Uh, this is an example of some of the rules of supervision. I'd like for you to just kind of glance at that. And I want to know how many of you all get off paper with these rules. <laughs> now we're going to touch on that a little bit more this afternoon. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, our panel, uh, individuals who have the latest experience, will touch on a little bit more of that uh, for you. And we'll have a QA afterwards. <coughs> This is a graph of prison admissions by prison admissions types. As you can see, that yellow line represents revocations only. The blue line represents individuals going into Wisconsin prisons for new sentences. The red line uh, represents revocations with new convictions. Last year, we had 3,900 something people uh, sent back into Wisconsin state prisons for the Yellow Line. 
It is the leading driver of prisons and missions in our state. What are we doing here? Seriously. What are we doing? Next slide. Uh, some information on the uh, Michigan sentencing bill. Uh, Michigan wasn't much different than us several years ago, seemed like eons ago, but uh, several years ago, they weren't much different from us, but they have made uh, drastic changes within their, their criminal justice system. And uh, we can read over this co with our representatives, uh, Republicans, and uh, all Republic uh, Senate and Assembly. And uh, the bills were passed in 2017, in March of 2017, Governor Rick Snyder, a, pro a probationer who commits a technical probation violation may be incarcerated for a maximum of 30 days for each violation. After the temporary incarceration, the probationer returns under the terms of his or her original probation order or new probation order at the court's dis discretion. Now, they're talking about probationers here. Probation, which is different from parole and extended supervision. Uh, you do not go back before a court if you're on parole or extended supervision. Uh, and you are heard by the administrative law judge to determine uh, if you're returned to prison. Uh, uh, for a short time or any time and return to the community. Uh, 8792 expands the earned release uh, programs. Uh, the current earned release programs applies to inmates with an AODA or uh, AODA and allows for early release upon successful completion of the DOC's treatment program. Expands eligibility for people if, to include people, others uh, that DOC is determined evidence based and proven to reduce recidivism. Uh, provide behavior with increased safety for inmates and staff, including educational, vocational, mental health. Uh, these are things that, that are, need to be done, uh, that are asking to be done under AB 792 and no more than 15% reduction of incarceration time added to extended supervision no inmate serves the entire sentence. Because today we do have to, we do serve the entire sentence. This is a graph, uh, something that uh, shows what Mississippi is doing. Mississippi. Government uh, signed a bill to make criminal justice system more efficient and less expensive. Ryan, uh, the House uh, 585 was, uh, became law July 1st. Protect public safety could save 266 million in prison expenses spread over two, uh, 10 years. Mississippi enacted comprehensive bipartisan criminal justice reform. Uh, it was, that is a hit. Time for reform is now. That's worth repeating. Time for reform is now. $8.6 million a year already spent on renting beds in county jails. $300 million estimated for a new prison, which uh, uh, I was at a legislative hearing on that. And uh, closing Green Bay and not only building a new prison, but bringing in private prison builders to build this facility. And the state of Wisconsin will rent that facility uh, with no cost, pretty much, until 2022, 20, I believe. Gil, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, 2022. I feel that the can is being kicked down the road and the door is being opened for private prison builders and companies to come into our state to run our prison system. And for-profit prisons are just what they are. Uh, 
actually, many of them ask for a guaranteed population. And it's 90, 95% that they ask for. Ohio that caught the trap, and now they're paying uh, for bids they're not filling out of their uh, state budget uh, because they're not meeting that uh, minimum requirement. Estimated $300 million for a new prison. And that is not talking about operational costs, uh, which would likely be several, several million dollars. Next steps. Repurpose Lincoln Hill, reform crime list revocation, expand earned release. It saves money, avoid major future costs, and it reduces crime. Here he put, uh, and the last slide that I have is the resources that he used. I, I, I wish that Representative Borky could have been here to do his presentation. I chopped it up, I know, but uh, I did want to just share some of that. And uh, we're going to just open it up for questions uh, after we hear from our panel. Did you have a question? Yeah. No, I, I, got your I don't know if you announced today about the passage of the bill on Lincoln Hill. Did you I, I did not announce that I had it here. Yeah. Okay. I think it's important. I think it's, it's just passed the committee. Right. Still has to pass the legislature. But this is the first positive major reform of the Wisconsin <laughs> <laughs> system in years. Okay? Yeah. And so we shouldn't hold our breath about it. But it is a really important step. And it was Republicans and Democrats working together. And the committee passed the bill today. And would repurpose Lincoln Hill to as well. Thank you. Uh, I did get a, uh, a, a text from uh, his office announcing that. And uh, I'm glad that you can bring that up. Uh, because Give me some good news. It's well. good news. It really is. Now, it's going to take a couple of years to yeah. do this. Yeah, 2020. Uh, because we have to build smaller facilities in the different regions to uh, house juvenile uh, individuals. I, yeah, do you know what the reason uh, was for the change in, in 2015 that the revocation only um, numbers went up so drastically? You know what changed? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's, you can see it's been high. Right. Back in 2007, 2008. Uh, it was a guesstimation of mine that over half the people going back into prison were going back for revocations. And we knew a lot of them. We worked with a lot of them, but over half of the new admissions were. So it did come down. It came down slightly. Uh, but if you look at 2011, uh, that's when we had administrative, administration change uh, in our government's office. And since then, you can see it dipped a little bit, but you can see how where it's spiking in 2015 uh, because like, uh, uh, 2014, uh, they were re-elected. Uh, <laughs> but in 2014, there was another election and the administration didn't change. And now it's like, you know, let's lock them up, uh, and throw away the key for any reason. And we're in the same state today. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, back in 2013, um, the state passed a law stating that the Department of Corrections had to come up with swift and certain sanctions uh -huh. for um, rule violations so that they weren't revoking so many people. Is uh, Representative Boyke's new bill uh, addressing the crimeless revocations because the State Department of Corrections 
has not complied, and they're several years overdue. Wow. That's, you know, you are absolutely right. And a lot of people aren't aware that correction is something that knows that our legislators and the law, because they're just starting to look at uh, uh, and create a grid for risk factors, uh, but they haven't gotten to the point uh, uh, that there's only so long an individual could be replicated. That's still open in it, and it's still uh, upon the administrative law judge, uh, which is, is very good to do process in that process. Yes, Karen? Um, Moses met with uh, the community supervision September 8th last year, and they told us that they didn't think they would be doing any rulemaking with regard to this act, uh, uh, switching certain sanctions from 2013 for another year, and then two, two weeks later, they did uh, issue a statement of scope <coughs> from those rules, which were sent to the governor and were approved, and so they should be in the rulemaking process at this time, we could put out a call for people to come to the public, rulemaking includes a public hearing. So we really have to be ready to deal with that public hearing. I am so glad you said that, Carol. Can I'm you so repeat what she that. said? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, after months of being stalled by DOC, uh, Moses people did meet with the community, uh, Division of Community Corrections on September 8th of last year and with a number of complaints and the biggest one was their failure to issue any rules even though the act that uh, Janice referred to explicitly said they were to uh, issue rules implementing the, the new legislation. And that was on September 8th and they had told us that they had no intention uh, at, this, at that point of uh, issuing rules and that it might be a year, a year and a half before they got around to it. And we were happy to see that on, I think, September 20th, they issued what's called the scope of rulemaking, which included these rules. And so in other words, they began the process of rulemaking uh, to implement uh, short-term sanction law. And so, uh, minute we hear <coughs> public hearings going to be held, we will publicize that. It's really important that we have a, a very significant presence uh, at that public hearing. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> being present at that public hearing, I think what, uh, in closing, we're going to get ready to bring our panel up. But I want to say that these are times that we can make a difference. Uh, and I just want to reflect on uh, President Obama's call to action to all of us in his last address uh, uh, to the American people. Just a, a, a little piece of it that I remember is he said, if you're tired of the way things are being done, quit complaining about it, run for office, grab a clipboard, be active and be an informed voter, be active in your communities. And I think right now is the time. You know, I, I, I was moving so fast here, I, I still want to take a moment of silence for our young people who were gunned down in Florida yesterday. If we have people representing us who will not move and get away from big interests or the NRA or whoever it is and pass some real laws uh, 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 with gun control. If those who we know are representing us but not saying something, it is time for them to go. It is time for change. This happens nowhere else in the world where 
2017, 22, even babies are gunned down in school. Only in America. What is wrong with us? We have to become more active and know the platform that individuals are running on, what they stand for, what they believe in. We have to take the time to be educated about these people who are asking for our votes. Sometimes you'll get the lesson of two evils, but you got the lesson of the two. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know. I, I'm moved in my heart and I'm sad that our young kids can't feel safe in school. This is, has to stop. It has to. And we need real, some real legislative gun that take all the assault weapons, period. You can't stop. Second Amendment rights. When the Second Amendment was written, it definitely wasn't in this day and time. But yet they're standing behind it anyway. Let me stop. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all on behalf of Expo, on behalf of Justified Anger, who I happen to be the uh, co-chair for the Criminal Justice Task uh, Force, and on behalf of Moses. Three organizations that are doing great work around what we believe uh, as far as criminal justice reform, transformation being needed. And this is what I want to see. We can't work in our silos. We all must work together, people. I just want to say that. I got on my soapbox now. But, uh, 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 it's serious. Times are serious. We have to educate one another. We got some great things coming up through wisdom. I, 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 and hopefully, uh, I can get somebody to touch on some of those things uh, because we have a rigorous schedule coming up. Don't remark. <laughs> a lot of work. But it's exciting time, too. And I don't know who all was at our gubernatorial forum uh, in January. I know that we can get criminal justice transformation at the forefront of this next uh, uh, gubernatorial election and some of our local elections. I'm going to ask the panel to come up. Thank you for it. <laughs> well, I say, ladies and gentlemen, Expo. That on. My name is Carrie Reese. I'm the director of research and program evaluation for Justified Anger. Um, and we are really happy to kick off this panel discussion today. We've got um, on the panel Mr. Frank Davis, who's a community organizer for Moses um, and Expo member. We have Melissa Lunen, who is the board president for Expo. We have Mark Rice, who is an organizer, statewide organizer for Expo. And last but not least, Mr. Aaron Hicks, who's a reentry specialist with Nehemiah and also an EXPO member. So I just wanted to ask you all if you could take about three minutes, three minutes, and tell the audience what brought you here. We'll just start with Frank. Uh, hello. My name is Frank Davis. What brought me here? Uh, well, I have a car. <laughs> uh, what brought me here? Well, a couple things. One, I have walked the path of those who are currently behind the walls and behind bars and who are struggling uh, to get um, treated like humans uh, coming out here to society. Um, what brought me here is that when I got out, I felt that it was a purpose of mine not just to uh, help out those who have uh, gone through the system, but those who are currently there. I work as an organizer for Moses, I work with Expo, 
and this is sort of like a passion of mine to be able to make sure that uh, those coming behind can have a better, uh, better treatment than those of us who have gone before. Thanks, Frank. Hi, everybody. Uh, what brings me here today is I spent five years at the Cheetah Correctional Facility at the age of 19. I came home when I was 24 years old. Um, I've been home for 10 and a half years. Um, during uh, my time of being incarcerated, um, I came to realize and see many women, the walks of life that they were coming from and what they were being incarcerated for. And their stories were very powerful and they were very touching to me. Um, during that time, we also had a chance to be able to see um, the treatment of women in the facility um, by officers, male officers. Um, so coming home in 2007, I made it a point to, I wasn't going to forget any of these women. Uh, several of us who were out after 2007 created a forum to track any women that were incarcerated, either at Cheetah, uh, John Burke, which is now back to a male facility, uh, the Milwaukee Center, and then um, Robert E. Ellsworth in Racine. Uh, with that forum, uh, we were able to track and see where the women were moving and going to uh, so that we could do a peer support, check in with them, see if they needed anything. Um, we were doing that for a couple years. Um, we still have that moving and going forward. Um, I also part at Expo. Um, I'm also the statewide grant coordinator for grassroots part of the project. I'm here tonight, as similar to Frank and Melissa, because of my experience in the Wisconsin State Prison System. The state of Wisconsin forced me to spend two years in the state prison system in 1999 and 2000. When I got out, I had 12 years of probation to do, became very familiar with a lot of the problems within the prison <laughs> system, and also became familiar with a lot of the problems with the system of mass supervision in Wisconsin. I did very well for my first six years out. I graduated, decided to go back to college. I got a degree from Upper Iowa University here in Madison in Human Services in 2006. I decided to move to Milwaukee in 2006 to attend graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I entered into the Urban Studies program there, I had a full tuition scholarship. I was working in the history department as a project assistant. And then a few weeks before I was going to start my second year of graduate school, Milwaukee police officers arrested me for disorderly conduct. When I was in prison, I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and during this incident, I was experiencing symptoms of my disabled mental condition. The police officers forced me to go to jail. They took me to the 5th District Police Station in Milwaukee in Fort and Locust. Went to court a few days later, the judge, the public defender, and the prosecutor all agreed that my behavior did not fit with the definition of disorderly conduct, but my agent moved forward with the revocation process. She forced me to spend six months in Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, which is one of the most inhumane prisons in the United States. While I was there, I had no access to sunlight, no access to, front, no access to fresh air. I was locked in a cell for over 20 hours a day. When I was there the first week, I was forced to sleep on the floor in a cell designed for one person, but there were three individuals in that cell. Tensions need very high in-person visits and there's no outdoor recreation, many human rights violations, the fights in the institution, and I saw how this institution was having a devastating impact on people who were already struggling with addiction and mental health issues. And recently, Expo decided to launch a campaign that aims to close down Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, which is known as MSDF, and it's an institution that was built just to house individuals who allegedly violated rules of probation, parole, and extended supervision. It was built in 2001 to accommodate Wisconsin's aggressive and racist community supervision system, and it was built to accommodate Wisconsin's extraordinarily high incarceration rate of African-American men and women, who is the majority of folks in this institution are people of color. It's been that way since it was opened in 2001, and so it's completely unacceptable for the state of Wisconsin to have 
a prison that's overcrowded with folks who've only been accused of rule violations and have not committed any new crimes. And so it's definitely time to shut down MSDF and it's time to decarcerate the law. Um, so I'm here, um, one, because I work here, but, <laughs> but um, because, because of each, each, each of the individuals you just heard, um, like, like them, I also was incarcerated for um, a significant amount of time. Um, and, and so um, my goal is to try to um, give back to the individuals who are still incarcerated um, because they don't have a voice. So I, I speak for those who, who, who dwell in the wilderness who aren't able to speak. Um, and so um, I think it's vital to get this information out what's going on and how everybody can get involved because it, this is just not our issue, it's a, it's a community issue as a whole. Um, and we can no longer just sit in our seats and just allow this stuff to take place. Um, we have to get involved, we have to make a difference um, because we, we, have, we know that 80, 90% of the people that get locked up will come back into the community and they're gonna need support. They're gonna need people to be out there for them, not to judge them, or, belittle them, but to help them um, to reacclimate back into the community. And so that's my reason why. Thanks. So I want to just address the terminology of crimeless revocation first and foremost, because when we do forums like these, that's usually the first bit of pushback that we get. And so to start out with that, I just want to give a definition. When we talk about revocations, um, we're talking about recidivism, primarily. The state of Wisconsin in 2011 or 2012 decided to redefine recidivism. Throughout the country, recidivism is defined as a person who's returning to prison with or without a new crime within three years after their release. Wisconsin redefined that so that we're talking about recidivism being returning to prison with a new sentence, but we're calling it reincarceration when a person returns to prison without a new sentence. So in essence, the state of Wisconsin gave us this word reincarceration which you could also describe as crimeless revocation. And the pushback we usually get um, for this is to say that, number one, many people go back to prison on a revocation with charges that could be filed, and there's no tracking of whether or not they're convicted. And then secondly, um, rule violations are assessed as um, behavior that could escalate and lead to a crime that is a threat to public safety. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that kind of conversation and what you think about the term crimeless revocation and what that means in terms of public safety. And we'll start with Aaron. What's kind of mean? So ask the question. Yeah, so, so the word crimeless revocation causes a lot of controversy mm. because we have people who feel that whether or not a person is convicted of a crime at the time of revocation, they were, they were exhibiting behavior that could have been a crime, or they might later be charged with a crime. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the term crimeless revocation? Well, the term in itself, um, I mean, I mean it's, it's basically stating the fact that, I mean, this person has not committed a crime, nevertheless, he's still able to uh, go back into the prison system based on either allegation, some type of rule violation, um, so things of that nature. Is that, is that where you're hitting off at? And so, and so, therefore, um, our our prison system is designed and set up on the basis of revocation. It, 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 the majority, our overcrowding is based on revocation. It has nothing to do with new crimes and uh, things of that nature. So we would assume, or we would think that based on the overcrowding of prison it had everything to do with people committing new crimes and that's not the case. Um, so it, it, I'm just using my own situation. I actually wear a GPS bracelet um, and I'm actually done with probation and parole but I still wear it um, for the rest of my life. But in sharing that, um, one of the situations that occurred where um, they have something on, the, on this bracelet called a tamper alert. That means if you bump it, Something happens in any way, shape, or form. What winds up happening is the process is you go to jail. Um, you go to jail, you wait for your agent to come, um, and then they ask you what took place, and you have to give a statement. 
and I share specifically with my age and not women, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, just some malfunctioning with the bracelet. Nevertheless, I was told that I had to write a statement saying that it was my fault that the temper alert happened. And if I didn't write that statement and say that, then they would send me back to prison. So these are the things that people are not conscious that take place on a regular basis all the time. To me, Department of Corrections is just completely throwing out due process. The key indicator is whether a person has been convicted of a crime or not, and so our definition of crime certification is when the Department of Corrections reincarcerates a person on probation, parole, or sentence supervision for allegedly violating the rule of supervision that does not involve a new conviction or a new crime. And so we've had there's so many examples. We released a book of stories a few years ago called the Abuse of Revocation in Wisconsin, and my story is just one of many. We have. The stories are out there, and we know that many people are being sent back for purely technical violations, and the Department of Corrections is just throwing out this number that around almost 80% of people who are sent back for crime and revocations have actually engaged in some sort of illegal activity, but they don't have any evidence of that. We asked for that. We did a health impact assessment on the consequences of excessive revocations. Expo partnered with Wisdom and Human Impact Partners and the UW-Madison School of Public Health and Medicine, and they don't have that evidence. And Representative Boyke noted that during the presentation here at the State Capitol when he gave this presentation the first time. He said the Department of Corrections doesn't have this. I'm trying to get better data on that, but I think the person, there's got to be, we got to maintain fairness in the process. There was a case in Milwaukee where an individual was covered by Gina Barton and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel a young man was driving the car of his partner, and his partner left the gun in the glove compartment. He was unaware of that. He was on supervision at the time. He went to court, was taken all the way to a jury trial, and he was found not guilty at the trial. But his agent stepped in and moved forward with the revocation process after he was found not guilty and forced him, he was sentenced to three years in prison. From the agent stepped in, overruled, so that's the type of power the agent had. And similar to my case, my disorderly conduct charge was dropped, but the agent can come in and still revocate a person after the charge is dropped. And then there are cases like, many of you are familiar with the case of Eric Gilbert, Tom and Jane Gilbert in the audience today. He's been sent back several times just for technical violations. Ex Milwaukee leader, Mete Perro, just wrote an op-ed in Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service. He's been, he has not been convicted of a new crime since 2001, but he's been sent back to prison now five times for crimes <coughs> rule violations. For example, having visitors at a transitional living facility, walking past the park, um, just accepting a job offer without prior agent approval. These are the type of things that people can get sent back for just for an average of 18 months in the crime certifications. And if there is a serious I mean, the person is still entitled to go through the process if there is some sort of, um, if the DOC, Department of Corrections, feels like there is something there, and then a person still, I don't, you can't just throw out a due process and decide to throw a person in prison without giving a person a chance to protect themselves through the legal process that is designed to give a person a fair chance to support. Thanks, Mark. Crime certification. I want to speak on the fact. I mean, it drives uh, the prison system. Um, speaking from the women's perspective, um, I can account every year around the winter time when it came to the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, a time of family. Um, a lot of women don't have their family when they get out. Um, they go back to circumstances that got them incarcerated, and so every year around winter time, you'd see the same the same group of women that would return. And what would happen is they would get a technical violation, a rule violation. Uh, but to them, that area was better to be in than to have nothing around that time. 
Uh, when we talk about rule violations, I want to say that every agent has their own discretion to decide if the rules that are given to you, they can take those away. Not everybody has to have the same rules. And so what, what, what's hard with that is, is one agent may say, these specific rules might not apply to you because it doesn't have anything to do with your case. Another agent may not do the same thing with another individual. And that's where you run into these circumstances. Uh, we also see people who are in relationships. Um, the abuse of power with somebody who's breaking up with somebody, whether it be an ex-boyfriend, whether it be an ex-girlfriend, it takes one phone call to call an agent and say something is happening to remove that person um, out of the way. And we've seen harm done with that um, in cases where these people weren't convicted of doing anything at all. Um, you see it with people who are getting a divorce. You see it with people with child custody situations. Um, this, this happens. And then you could be sitting for a month at a time waiting to get released to be told there was nothing that came from that. Thanks, Melissa. Frank? When you speak about crime revocation, one of the things you said that um, and I've heard a lot of agents say that if you break a rule, then you are exhibiting criminal behavior. And in some instances, I say, okay, yeah, if I'm out here robbing a bank, stealing cars, if I'm doing something like that. However, when we talk about crime is revocation, there's no crime involved. So a lot of these rules that people are sending back, getting sent back to prison for, they aren't exhibiting criminal behavior. There, you got a laptop without permission, you got a job without getting permission, you got a cell phone without permission. Um, you know, you, you, you use someone's car without permission, even if you have a license. These are things that can send you back to prison. So when I look at it, I don't look at it in the sense that this is criminal behavior. I look at it in the sense of understanding not just the institution, understanding the, the system which has been created it's, it's been created in ways to give people in power every opportunity they can to uh, put their will over someone else. And in this situation, we've already seen that majority of the agents wind up sending minorities, black and brown people back and forth to prison, and you don't have no means and no ways to counter it. This is, when I hear that saying that this is a criminal behavior and breaking rules, I say no. This is a means and a method for PO supervisors and a system to you to control and destroy the lives of so many people who are on parole. So I have one more question and then we'll take some from the audience. So what Representative Goyke has proposed are some pretty big reforms um, that can really go a long way for reducing our prison population and really resulting in better outcomes for everyone involved in the criminal justice system from people who are convicted of crimes to people who work in the system. And so my question is to you is, which one of the, if people had to pick one to really get behind out of um, the reform of Lincoln Hills, uh, expanding the earned release program, um, and then the revocation issue, if people had to pick one to get behind, which one would you recommend? Any volunteers? Uh, anything that has to do with reforming the, crime, uh, the revocation system, in my opinion, is a, a big deal because you have, on average, 3,000 people a year going back and forth to prison. These are people with jobs, with families. I'm t these are individuals who are the breadwinners who take care of their families and their homes, and they are just ripped out, not for committing a crime, but for breaking a, a, a rule. Some of them have alcohol problems, drug problems. Some of them have anger problems. Some of them have other uh, individual and emotional and mental health problems. So from, from my standpoint, I see how if you take someone who is constantly working and struggling to try to get back on their feet, and all of a sudden, because you don't like them and you want to try to show them that you're in control and you over their life and you can do what you will, and when you grab them about society, out about our home, from their family, from their kids, that can destroy someone in a in a in a in, in a way in my mind that is totally devastating and the ripple effect to the kid and the other family member and even society by taking them out. So for 
So from my standpoint, reforming this the revocation system so people aren't going back and forth to prison when they actually need help, that is very important. Thanks. Who's next? Melissa? Tough question. Um, I, I'm just going to speak on just the experience of women and just to add in this piece. Um, you know, women tend to be the unforgotten of mass incarceration, especially black women. And when we talk about uh, the state of Wisconsin, um, since 2009, the state of Wisconsin is one of eight states that has had an increase of women into the prison system and into jails. And with that, we talk about, uh, you know, when we look at urban release, expanding the urban release program, a lot of women, you know, go, uh, go into the prison system um, with low-level drug offense charges, property crimes. Uh, these women are going into the system already traumatized with having to deal with sexual assault and physical abuse. So they're going in as a victim and having to live in a prison system and be re-victimized by the male officers that are at that facility. Uh, a lot of women who are required to have to do treatment under treatment sentencing, if you do not get an opportunity to get into the treatment program, you're still going to go home. You know, so for example, with Cheetah, if you have 200 women that need to do treatment, you have 20 beds. And that really comes down to an officer's discretion if they feel like you're ready or you're the next person to be able to go on treatment. A lot of times, you know, we can even look at men and women. Uh, when women or men have to complete programming, the officers control that in the institution as to when it can happen, but they can be a part of it. Um, so back to your question, that's a tough one, but I would definitely go with um, expanding her uh, release. For me, the most important bill that Goyke has proposed in this package is the promise revocation bill. And this bill is an important first step in transforming the revocation process in Wisconsin, but has to go much further. Eventually, we can. Representative Boyke knows that. We've got to address the entire mass supervision system, and we've got to get back, and we've got to transform, we have to go back and repeal truth and sentencing, replace it, we've got to address sentencing, because right now there are far too many people on supervision for far too long, and this is a system that, it's not a gift to get supervision in Wisconsin, or probation is a trap. The supervision system is used to stalk people, especially people of color, and there's not enough rehabilitation. We need a massive expansion and funding of the TAD program, Treatment Alternatives and Diversions. We need more community-based alternatives and incarceration. And transforming the crime certification process and the revocation process in Wisconsin is key to closing down the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. And that's a first step towards our goal of getting this building shut down, which is one of the most inhumane prisons in the United States. Even the former warden of the facility, Floyd Mitchell, said that Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility is the worst prison in the United States. And in order to shut down MSDF, we've got to stop filling the prison up with people who've allegedly committed crimes rule violations, and it's a very important step. And it's got a, there's a lot of limitations out of that, that it excludes anyone who's been accused of engaging in illegal activity so the, by the Department of Correction Standards. And so we want to see that expanded to, so it gets to more people, to all people who are facing potential reincarceration for crimes or revocations. And really we have to focus on blowing up the whole system and transforming the whole system and implementing Wisdom's blueprint for any mass incarceration in Wisconsin, which includes, like I said, expanding funding for treatment alternatives and incarceration, giving pe people a fair chance of parole, expanding early release, ending crimes revocations, ending even holds for crimes revocation, for crimes rule violations, which are having a huge detrimental impact on county jail systems and especially in Milwaukee. Do it all. <laughs> so I would, I would have to echo some of the same things, but something I, I want to share with you guys, um, I don't think people really understand what happens to an individual who continues to go in and out, in and out. Their mental stability is completely off. They definitely um, 
witness a, a type of trauma that takes place because, you know, to, to, to be out in the community one day and then your whole life just stripped for a period of time, um, that in itself affects that individual so much. So, so I would have to echo the crime is revocation piece because for individuals to go back and forth, in and out, when they got livelihoods, they got, um, you know, their, their home, they got a house or a home or apartment or whatever, they got jobs, and to, 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 have to, to have to go to jail, lose everything, only to come back out and start over again, that is a trauma within itself. So um, I would have to echo some of the same things. And one thing I wanted to um, just point out, specifically as you were talking about the women piece, um, something most people don't know, and I, just hope you chime in on this. Prisons was never designed for women, <coughs> period. So the whole the whole setup for women is is all the way wrong anyways. Um, they, they don't have the, the same outlets as men and you know for women to come in there and they're pregnant and all these different things. They don't they, 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 it's not even designed for them. So they just part of they part of the casualties that take place. Um, and so they still put them in there, but it's not even, it, it's not effective, and that in itself causes a, an additional trauma, along with just being incarcerated in itself, has its own set of traumas. Um, and so therefore, I would have to push for crime and revocation. Melissa, did you want to comment on? Sure, I'll kind of just reiterate that. I think as a woman, when we look at a big thing that we get as annual physical, and what all comes with that, that doesn't happen. When we talk about mammograms, it's not happening. Uh, when we look at menopause things related to women that are older, that's not being addressed. Uh, the average woman incarcerated at two is 36 years old. But they need to have those things. And when we talk about providing proper uh, sanitary for a woman's monthly cycle, that's not there. So in a women's facility, off of what Erin said, is um, currently a cheated correctional institution. When you look at vocational needs, there's building maintenance, office software, there's dental, dentures. Very minimal. And again, the treatment options are minimal. One of the best things that has ever come out for women specifically is a trauma-informed care program at Wisconsin Resource Center. Six months. A lot of women have improved and were able to deal with those pains from trauma. That needs to happen more for a lot of those women. <coughs> Um, just to kind of reiterate, uh, going back to what Erin had said, um, you, it's a survival mechanism that you're in this facility, you have anxiety, there's trauma, am I going to live the next day? Am I going to survive? If I don't feel good or something's happening, can I get to see the doctor? Not always is the case. It doesn't happen. You know, just to quick share a little um, story. There was a young girl, 14 years old. She was at Southern Oaks, held at Southern Oaks, fighting. That's what she knew how to do. This girl ended up at the Cheetah Correctional Facility without being charged with felony in a courthouse, in a court of law with a judge. She was fighting officers at Southern Oaks. They charged her with a felony battery to prisoner. Three years. They sent this child to Cheetah Correctional Institution, 14 years old, in solitary confinement, and I sat next to her in a different cell. She had no money. All of this that was going behind the scenes. Then we had a, uh, another lady, 18 years old, committed suicide. Observation watch. Officer was right there. Didn't open the door when she was hanging herself, waited for another officer to come in. Her family had been paid $250,000 out of an ACLU situation. But another lady, I have, I'm having chest pains, I don't feel good, go sit down. Count came around, nobody checked to see why she didn't stand up. She died in her bed. Chest pains. So, when women have to deal with that, am I gonna make it the next day? I have to really take care of myself because nobody's gonna take care of me. At which point does a woman need to really address trauma and really address the issues as to why she's gotten there in the first place. So we have time for one, maybe two questions from the audience. Anyone? 
everybody. Yes? So I have a question about the time certification. The part that, that is, well, it's all serious, but one of the parts that is serious is that how much power the agent has to make a determination about whether or not you go back. And you mentioned that the, if the judge and the jury can determine that no, this was, this was not a good effort, this didn't live up to whatever standards were trying to propitiate, but the agent then has that power. What does that mean for any bill or anything that is ultimately passed if the person with the wherewithal to make a determination about whether or not something goes back isn't necessarily addressing the contents of that legislation? What, else, what happens with that individual to take away their power to do that? Great. So the question was about the power imbalance and the discretion that um, DOC, Department of Corrections, has over courts of law and due process in sending people back to prison. And what would that mean for a bill or how would we pass legislation that would address that kind of thing? Well, I would say from this standard, from a, from a legal aspect, if, if, if something does come up where it changes law, it has to change the administrative code and the other things that give the agents the power. Because a lot of times the administrative code actually gives them the power to do what they do. Because if you take them to, you take them to court, do all that, the court's going to say they're going to refer back to the administrative code and the power that they have. However, once bills are enacted, a lot of times, and I've dealt with this personally, a lot of times when something has changed, it takes a couple of inmates to actually file cases on them to contest it before agents finally get to the point of saying, okay, well, we want to do this. Same thing happened with laptops, cell phones, and they were telling people they couldn't have them. Uh, people had to actually stand up and file <coughs> before agents eventually said, okay, because it is a system, it, they are conditioned to do it. A lot of them, I hate to say, love to do it, but some of them seem like they enjoy their job a little more so than others. So because of that, there would be this propensity, you know, to keep pushing forward. And quite honestly, and this is the unfortunate part about those who are within the system, a lot of times when we know that they're doing something wrong, when we know that they're doing something against laws, rules, administrative codes, against our human sanity and our human frailty, we still don't stand up because a lot of times we feel that we're by ourselves, we're alone, and if we do stand up, what's going to happen? The system is going to come back on us. They're going to retaliate. And a lot of times we don't want to deal with it, and some of us can't deal with it. We don't have the capacity to deal with it because we have dealt with the crushing blow of the system for so long. That's the reason why it takes this community. I just can't do it. We just can't do it together. It takes a community. Professor Pam Oliver, who's UW Madison sociology professor, she mentioned during her presentation at our revocations forum, there was a time in Wisconsin where agents rarely sent someone back to prison for a crime of revocation. Many of them had backgrounds in social work and were really concerned about rehabilitation. And so just, I think there's a change in culture that's needed within the Department of Corrections and that starts at the top with the governor, I think it's very, really important for us to engage and get involved in this election process and get involved in integrated voter engagement, canvassing, getting out, knocking on doors, making sure that we're pushing the candidates, putting a lot of heat and pressure on the candidates to go further and to get some changes in there. When we can see changes in the legislature and changes in the executive branch, then we're going to see changes in the people running the Department of Corrections as well. And there's some within the Department of Corrections right now that want more rehabilitation, want more treatment alternatives. And that's one of the key findings of the health impact assessment is that there's a shortage of treatment alternatives to revocation in most communities. We need more investment to give agents more of options because some of them are just going to default, going to revocation because they don't have the options that they need to put people into rehabilitation programs in the community. So we need to build up that infrastructure to give those agents the opportunity to do that. And then 
the change with the top, if we kept Governor Walker, I mean, this, obviously that's a huge obstacle to change the Department of Corrections, but we've seen candidates, other candidates talking about that we need to change this. It's not acceptable to have a state that's sending thousands of people back to prison for crimes and revocations each year. And so it's really a key year in 2018, as Jerome said, now is really the time for us to have an impact and to get involved. We can have a real influence in shaping 2018 and beyond, and now is the time to start and get involved and get involved with this organizing, get involved talking with people, and really putting pressure on candidates and changing the system. And we will see some of these laws passed and some of the changes internally that need to be made in order to get what we need pushed forward. I just want to include this, this, this. When we talk about crime's revocation, um, just to sort of like toss this out there. I had to deal with it. Um, I was doing real good, working real good, had a full-time job. Um, I was doing freelance writing for a, a magazine and a newspaper here in Madison. Doing real well. I decided to, well, just through the course of action, broke up with my ex, start dating another one. And in my, in my ex's head, she had in her head that we would still get together. I was trying to be friends just for some fact, I don't like burning bridges and making enemies. However, she saw me with this new girl that day. She decided to call my PO because she got ticked off and mad. And she told me, I want to make you hurt like I'm hurt. So she called my PO, told her all these lies. And my PO decided to want to come and lock me up. So I get locked up. Now, understand at the time, I had a good job making good money. This is somebody who I did 20 years in prison, went in at 18. No degrees, no working, no nothing. Got out in 2007. I was able to get me a job, started my own business. I was doing real well. Probably making close to $50,000. When my agent came and got me and locked me up, I told him, I said, you know, the only reason why she did this is because she wanted to try to pay me back and get back at me. He was like, yeah, I know. I'm like, really? He was like, yeah, you done something. Okay. So they wanted to, after all of this was said and done, she took all these lies. Once it was narrowed down and everything got to simmering and cooled down, they revocated me for having a laptop without permission, a cell phone without permission, and they sent me back to prison for 32 months. No crimes, no nothing, doing real well, but yet still they said that, and this was, it was all my age, because Supervisor basically rubber stamped everything. I filed a complaint, did everything I was supposed to do, did my due diligence, and it was nothing. What I accomplished out here was nothing. I had people write me letters, coming up there, you know, keeping my job. Now, I was an individual that I was fortunate in this regard. Because of the job that I had and because of how long I had it, I had what you, what you call PTO. Something that a lot of people on parole and probation don't have. So because I had PTO, because I had vacation, because I had all these other things, I was able to stretch my job out and still get paid for about a month and a half, two months. Because of just the way things worked out. I still lost my job because I went back to prison. But think about this. People who get out of prison, they have jobs. They don't have careers. So they can't sit up and get, if they get locked up for a week or two weeks, Guess what? They done lost their job. On average, on revocation, somebody, you, you, you get locked up for, on average, about uh, three months. So that's 90 days. How many of those people do you think kept their job? So when you talk about crime as revocation, when you talk about how it affects individuals, you have people <coughs> that are on parole that they know that when they get locked up, they already have it in their head that they're going back to prison. Don't even let there be a suspicion of a new crime being charged, even if they didn't do it. Because they know if a charge gets brought up in prison, I mean in the courts, even if they know it's going to be found not guilty, that is enough to send people back to prison. And right. It has happened over and over and over again. So crimes revocation isn't just this term that we made up. Crimes revocation isn't just this term that doesn't really affect nobody or affect people that need to be punished. No, crimes revocation affects so many different people. Now guess what? 
people who actually had jobs and had careers and got locked up and lost their job. Now all of a sudden, if somebody who's been in prison come back and try to get a job there, that's how hard it's gonna be. This is how the system contaminates society against people who are trying to come back out and put their life back on track. So that's I just right. want to put that out there. And then just to put that in perspective, um, people say if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Um, yes, rule, rules are violated or broken occasionally, but what's the appropriate consequence? Is going back to prison, is that is a person that has a laptop, do they do we need to protect the public from that individual? That's what prison is for. Um, so just a reminder to put that in perspective. I want to be mindful of our time, and um, I'm sure the panelists will be here for a couple of minutes if you want to ask questions, but please help me thank at the door if you give us your email address we will follow up and send you the health impact assessment that has been referenced tonight we'll send you a copy of inmate 501 so you have it electronically and i'll find out if we're able to send the powerpoint slides um, i believe they're public okay yeah we'll send those out as well excellent well in closing uh again what a power and to be honest with you, I'm stressed. Just imagine going, uh, being on paper in this day and time. Can you imagine what someone who's currently on supervision is a traffic ticket, whatever? It's a possibility of you going back to jail. A more than good possibility that you're going to jail. And, 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 and lose everything. That was my problem with the system in working in it. Seeing these individuals who I know personally losing their jobs because a ticket, I know a traffic ticket, police contact, they call that. I see someone, the officer asked him a question, he didn't report it and was locked up because he didn't report that police contact. It had nothing to do with that. Anyway, uh, what I really wanted to, to do before we close tonight is uh, take a moment of silence uh, for our children and their families in Florida. There's many of them in hospitals and too many died. And I want to take a moment of silence uh, for our nation. Thank you for coming out tonight. The panel, our panelists have been around for a, a while and uh, get engaged. Get engaged.